How's our financial plan coming? Super. Chris, any advice? With Western and Southern, preparing for your financial future can be easier than you think. Favorite receiver? Huh? To get started, visit westernsouthern.com. Steve, we had to come back to this because it just got, it got too intense. We didn't have enough time left to fully True dive story. into it. We had to take a week off. So we're 10 weeks in. Settle. We went to therapy, Steve and I. <laughs> We've worked through our differences. We're going to talk uh, coach of the year here. I just have a general question, which is when you're trying to think about which coach has been the best this year, what are the types of things that you value really highly? Because I think a lot of people are kind of all over the place with it. I think you have to exceed expectations, one. And that's what always hurts Belichick is his expectations are the highest. Right. Um, and what helps a guy like John Harbaugh, whose team, you know, the Vegas over-under for them going into the year was like eight and a half wins, and they're already at seven. So it's like, you, you know, that to me it's expectation. Uh, it's probably why Bill hasn't won, you know, his fair share, but that's to me is the first starting point. I don't know if he's won any because of that. I really yeah. don't. But, like, you know, I think, I think a lot of it is – based off that, and then that, that expectation starts with what our perception is of the roster. So if New England's always starting with what we think is the best roster, even though Belichick's a part of building that and all that stuff, okay, so he'll never exceed expectations. Then you've got teams that maybe have greater, better quarterbacks, maybe their expectations aren't that high. So then you have a, a Bears situation like last year where it's like, well, they have Trubisky and the defense came together, okay, that looks good. Or Sean McVay turned the Rams around 2016 to 17, you know, that's pretty significant. So I think that's where most voters lean. And I think you know, that's what I have in my head as a coaching job, because the head coach eventually, you know, essentially is responsible for wins and losses. But then there's different pieces along the way that you can focus on. So well. we're talking about Freddie Kitchens isn't in the running? Right. Not quite. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. quite make it into the top tier. I mean, because I mean, look, I, I look at you're right. I mean, when the high, when the expectations are high, it's hard because we expect New England to be top of the division and win the division and, you know, be in the AFC championship game almost automatically. So it's tough. And, but you, you know, sometimes I look at circumstances too. I mean, you look at what the Steelers are going through right now and the job Mike Tomlin's doing with, uh, you know, what he has and, you know, and I really feel like teams, uh, first lose out mentally and emotionally. That's when they tap out. And it's not even the physical abilities at first. So when I see a team like the Steelers, the position they were in, and right off what four straight, it's like wow. I mean, they're, they're keeping the player. You know, Tom is keeping the players engaged and things like that. So, so I think look at circumstances. I look at like a Cal Shanahan. You know what I mean? Like what he's doing in San Fran. I know he has uh, the good players around him, good defense, but I just think he's doing a terrific well, job. Well, do you think that hurts him too? So I was thinking about Shanahan earlier, and I haven't heard his name come up nearly as often as, as Harbaugh's, which is interesting. And I think the big reason for that is the Niners' success has been derived predominantly from the defense. Right, and right. We, I mean, I was watching on Monday night. How many times did you see Shanahan? How many times did you see Robert Sala? Yeah. Now, I get that Sala's, you know, good-looking good looking middle, good like look middle Eastern you know? guy. <laughs> good-looking Middle Eastern guy. He works out before the game. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm Italian, you know. I'm Middle Eastern. Okay. That's why I'm I'm giving him, I like, I'm bringing him onto my team. Okay. You can <laughs> go ahead. I stick with my pasta. Well, we can we can share the Robert Sala <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it's a good it's a good right? point. It's like yeah. it, it's again the attrib attribution of credit is something that is that is a hard problem yeah. in football. And when you look at that team, there's the one hand where the quarterback play is, has been up and down, and then there's the other hand where the defense has been great. And so, like, how much do you just subtract for the, for, or add to the former, subtract from the latter? It, it's a really good question and why this problem, I think, will get multiple answers uh, from multiple people. The thing that should work in Shanahan's favor is a lot of the work that you guys have been doing to kind of, the, the things I felt like I was doing intuitively that you guys have now backed up with actual hard numbers. You know, for years I would say, okay, I think this coach does a good job of getting the most out of this quarterback or whatever it is. And Shanahan has a track record of that success. And I think... They didn't win games the last couple of years because he was rolling C.J. Beathard out there. And I think we need to look back and be like, C.J. Beathard, Nick Mullins, what he did just to compete with those guys was incredible. Yeah. Now, Jimmy G, I think, is far better than those guys. He's not a top 10 quarterback right now this year. Mm -hmm. But you give that to Shanahan, and now you've got a team that's 8-1 and one combined with the defense. So he's a history of being a good play caller and 
the ability to elevate offense. What about things like preparation? For example, we've done this thing where we've looked at scripted plays for both the NBC broadcast and also just for the way that we've looked at like first quarter totals, uh, you know, halftime totals and stuff like that. Like you look at teams like Green Bay, you look at teams like Kansas City, Minnesota, uh, Oakland this season as well. They're teams that in their scripted plays offensively have been awesome, right? They've above and beyond even you know, they have a hard time maintaining it just because of regression, but there are teams that have been jumping on other teams early in, early in games, and that's been hard for their opponents to come back from. How much does preparation, how much does that factor in versus how much does, you know, the idea of like, you know, Matt Nagy last year against Green Bay, first 15 plays amazing, get out to a huge lead, and then struggle down the stretch. Right. So like how, mu how much is, is thinking on your feet worth and how much is preparation during right. the week? Decision making. Because right. Yeah. Let's start talking about some of the guys that are that are in the running here or that we think should be in the running. And when you talk about preparation, you can prepare to make decisions mm -hmm. in certain situations. You know, on fourth downs. I'm sure Steve, you knew this intuitively many years ago, and now numbers have started to back this up. Yeah, I, I was here, and you guys were like, yeah, go this <laughs> further, go much further than what you thought. But like what Harbaugh has done this year in terms of making decisions to go for it early in games, on the other side of the field, we saw fourth and five against Kansas City, and that didn't pay off for him, but he was undeterred, right? He believes in his process. I think that's another part of it. There's the, pro the preparation and then actually doing it on the field. Um, so is Harbaugh number one? In, well, and, in and, then, and then I think it's adjustments, you know what I mean? Halftime yeah, adjustments. Sure. You, you could see a team rattling it off in the first half, but come back, like the Steelers-Rams games. I was waiting to see what McVay's adjustments were in the second half. I think Bill Belichick, he's always one of the best to have good in-game adjustments. So you're right, thinking on, on your feet. And then, you, I mean, Harbaugh, man, it's hard to overlook what he's done. And I think when we talk about Kyle Shanahan and they're showing Robert Sala a lot, but who who's orchestrating this whole yeah, thing? Who hired that person? Right. In, in Harbaugh, who's you know orchestrating this this whole thing with the offense and defense and coming together and you know Shanahan Sala and you know what I mean? So it, it's it's that big CEO type of a mm -hmm. of a corporation that's that's getting it done. Yeah, and even adjusting within a season as well. We saw you know yeah. Kellen Moore and the and the Dallas Cowboys terrifically early on against a weaker schedule, sort of come back to the pack a little bit. Uh, during this, you know, second part of the season here, you know, it'll be interesting to see like Doug Peterson, for example. I don't think he's really in this conversation right now, um, but a couple of lucky, unlucky things go lucky this time, and he might be in the conversation near the end of the season. So, um, we, you know, to your point about Tomlin, people were talking about the Steelers job being an open job during the first month of the season. It was sort of a foregone conclusion. And sometimes, you know, when you talk about players, like if a player doesn't think that the coach is going to be around for a while, like I don't know how that messes with, yeah. with your psychology. But, you know, he, now winning four out of five, you know, looking like a, a playoff team in the AFC, that's a really not only and they've been a really good team offensively in terms of script versus non-script. They mm -hmm. tend to adjust as the game goes along. But also during the season, they've been that way well, as well, struggling early you know, coming on so, a little bit late, which and, is a, and it's like a Mike testament. Zim, is Mike Zimmer like in the running too? I mean, maybe, but he's not. He's probably not going to win his division, right? So that's tough. Yeah, right. Well, not only and that, that seems so, good. Just going back to Doug Peterson real quick, he was like the poster child for the fourth quarter decision making, right? A couple of years ago, where does he stack up this year? Because he's even though the results haven't been great for the Eagles, as you mentioned, there were points earlier in the year where it's like his own thirty, he's going for it, and you know we're all saying great job. I think he's made a lot of good decisions. I don't know where he stacks up in the rankings. Yeah, though. I mean, this is an example, and we, we first started doing this and we started studying coaches a couple of years ago, which is this idea that like Doug Peterson does a bunch of things that are impressive, and, and that's awesome, right? Uh, Sean McVay is not even in this conversation right now. For the last, you know, previous two years, he was the next darling of the NFL. No coach does everything perfectly is, is right. the main thing. And the first thing we saw was we watched a bunch of Eagles games during their Super Bowl season, and we found they run the ball too much on second and long, right? They uh, they force they force That's a lot a of third. That's a huge one. They, the force, a, they yeah. force a lot of third downs to their quarterback. And in 2017, Carson Wentz nailed all those third down yeah, plays. Yeah, he was incredible much on like, third down. Much like Russell Wilson does or much like Dak Prescott did on Sunday Night Football. And, like, we can be deceived by results in some ways – so even Peterson, Peterson does a lot of things really well. I think that, that that team is, you know, well put together from an analytical perspective, but you can poke holes in them as well. And that keeps and so the hard part is when you're thinking about this award, 
and you want to discredit a coach, you can find something for yeah, every coach. Of and and so that you have to sort of add it up. Although it's hard to find something with Harbaugh. I was going to say, I mean, Harbaugh has done almost everything right. He beat the Patriots. They have a big game this week against the Texans. But where I think he does get hurt a little bit is the fact that Greg Roman is a guy that should be getting a ton of praise for this, right? He has yep. orchestrated this offense. He's the mind behind it. And it's been absolutely phenomenal. And then also, Mar Jackson, I know people gave him a ton of crap coming into the NFL. But the dude's a freak athlete. Yeah. So... I mean, as much as it's impressive that they've designed a good offense, they also have a uniquely talented athlete at quarterback. And he's also he's just hitting more throws he's above improved. previous expectations. So let's throw out some other names here. Here's a guy that um, that I wanted to, that I think has done a tremendous job that probably isn't getting a lot of press this week. That's Sean Payton. So Sean yeah. Payton gets dealt a terrible hand, right? The question with Teddy Bridgewater coming in is. What are the Saints going to do? Are they preparing for yeah. next year? Like, right. you know, what's the deal here? They go undefeated with Teddy Bridgewater as a starter. I, you know, ironically just lost with uh, Scored Drew nine Brees, points with right? Breeze. Right. Right. But to me, what Sean Payton has done with a really crappy hand this year, still having a chance to get a bye in the playoffs, deserves some conversation. Yeah, but even yeah. with Peyton, and, and again, Peyton is in this conversation. He made our article a couple weeks ago, et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing with Peyton is exactly what we saw the other day. Coming out of a bye against a team that's yeah. all for dead, and you, and you get a stinker, and you look at, like, I think the last four seasons, they've failed to cover the spread in the first two games of every all those. You know, they come out slow in these games. Um, luckily for them this year, they actually beat Houston in week one, but they lost to Tampa Bay last year uh, in Minnesota the year before. And it's like... So even then, he's like a very good, and he's not only a very good play play caller, play for play, which I think somebody like Doug Peterson kind of lacks, but he has Doug Peterson's machismo for going for it on fourth down. And I think even more to the point, and this could be noise or this could be, uh, you know, something real, is he's rebuilt that defense. And, you know, he's been the head coach of a team that, you know, you put the right person in place as a defensive coordinator, and they're accentuating that talent. The defense is I think low key one of the best in the NFL, and and you know he deserves a lot of credit because he could have just continued his coaching career as one of the best play callers in the league, going seven and nine every year because of a bad defense, and you know they've allocated some resources there and, and done well. It's similar to the Tomlin conversation, right? Because if it was Breeze at the helm the whole year, we're probably not talking about him. It's like, well, there's another top five play caller again, paired with a Hall of Fame quarterback. They're going to have success. Yeah. But when you're dealt, hey, I got to win with Mason Rudolph. Or an undrafted free agent, Hodges, or I got a I got a win with Teddy Bridgewater, and you do it, then yeah, I think that instantly that, puts you in the conversation. And that's what I look at as circumstances of what coaches have to because during a season, during a game, there's so many ups and downs throughout it that it's decision making. It's you know halftime adjustments. It's in season adjustments of benching this guy for this guy or bringing this guy. You know, it, it's tough. But you know, with Harbaugh and what he's doing, um, that's one that's. I guess I don't want to say sustainable so far this season. I mean, he's he's done such a good job all season yeah. that he hasn't dealt like a – I guess it's different situation what Tom is kind of going through and Sean Payton because, yeah, that's a good mention because I forgot about Payton, but he's definitely – I've got a couple more there. names. You have here. more names. I have more names. Wow. This is uh, almost a makeup award because I think we know that last year it was stolen – the award was stolen from its rightful owner. Frank Reich should have won this award last year. Yeah. And I'm not saying that this year proves that to be true. Last year proved it. But he's done an amazing job this year. Now he's getting screwed over doubly, right? His quarterback retires before the season, and now his backup quarterback's hurt, and he gets mm -hmm. all-time bad performance for Brian Hoyer. But the fact that the Indianapolis Colts are competitive, to me, is almost amazing and Frank Reich has leveraged the run game he's changed that offense to fit Jacoby Brissett and made Brissett a really effective quarterback who isn't grading particularly well but their offense with him on the field is very efficient yeah that, it's, that's my favorite way of of balancing those two things is you know quarterback average to below average grade production is good okay that either means you've got incredible playmakers or a good play call we call that the reverse Trubisky oh, <laughs> the reverse Trubisky um, what did you love about Frank Reich last year? Uh, the, my thing with Frank Reich was he decided to make fourth down decisions last year, a la Doug Peterson, that to me kind of turned around the culture of that team. Yeah. Like we, a lot of people gave him heck for 
that overtime decision right against Houston to go for as a fourth and four. And they didn't get it. They ended up losing the game. And mathematically, he was backed up. It was a close one, but he was backed mm-hmm. up. And to me, that culture has permeated. Well, not only that, but he said, you know, they lost the AFC South because of that. And then they went into Houston in the playoffs and beat the Houston Texans, sort of overcoming the, the short-term noise that was a fourth down uh, in overtime. For me, for Reich, it was the, the if Andrew Luck's career was going to be prolonged, he did his best. Yes. Like yeah. throwing shorter passes, you know, still having T.Y. Hilton be an extremely efficient wide receiver, taking two tight ends, one of which was a bust first round top 10 <laughs> pick in Eric Ebron and making him a touchdown machine. The running backs as well, like, you know, sort of that, but also putting the, the defense in the hands of Matt Eberflus, right? All of this stuff is, Toledo by the way, guy. all of this Toledo stuff is, is, by the way, he was their second choice. So he got the second pick of the litter in, my, in many cases in terms of, um, you know, who his assistants were. And that defense, very, not very talented, but, you know, showed up pretty well last you, season. In a unique season. way, too, playing a bunch of cover two and yeah. just different concepts. You could have been an NFL tight end if you had as many open shots as That's Eric what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I meant we call that a Trubisky, not a reverse Trubisky. It's Quarterback plays Trubisky. terrible. Right. Team does well. The Trubisky. The Trubisky um, way. I've got another one, and this one I've been waiting to, to throw out to you guys. Because he's not, he's not my coach of the year right now. But I'm looking forward in my crystal ball, and the narrative that I want to hear about from weeks 15 to 17 is this one. John Gruden, coach of the year, and I'm going to lay out my case here. We talk about good decision making. Second and long, we know the Raiders like to run the ball. You know the three teams that are making the best choices on second and long? Yeah. The Patriots, the Cowboys. The Raiders are up there. Yeah. The Raiders over the last five weeks have a top five passing offense. Over the course of the season, they have a top 10 offense. Eric mentioned those first 15 plays. I believe they're sixth in yards per play on their first 15. And they're good in both running and passing in those downs. They're good in both great. running and passing. They had the Antonio Brown disaster. Talk yeah. about a CEO. <laughs> I mean, that people thought that team was left for dead. They have a legit shot to make the playoffs. I think if the Oakland Raiders make the playoffs this year, John Gruden, coach of the year. Those two, that team is 5-4 and four right now. Bengals at home, Jets on the road. Kansas City on the road will be a tough one. And then Titans and Jags, both in Oakland. The NFL somehow scheduled their last game in Oakland to be week 15 oh, for some reason. add that to the mix. Yes. They were away for five straight yeah. weeks in yep. London. I mean, they're traveling all yeah. across yeah, the world. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and so you're talking about, okay, they can go 4-1 and one in this stretch, 3-2 and two at worst. You're talking about 8-6 eight, you know, eight and six going into the last two weeks. And you have to go on the road, but it's familiar foes and the Chargers, whom they've already beaten, uh, and the Broncos as well, who they beat in Week One. Like this is this could be a ten and six team. Jeez. What do you guys think? In which case, I'm you on know, board with Green. Well, and here's the other thing I about like the it. Oakland Raiders: is their defense is terrible out loud, and so the the Raiders having to overcome a defense where they, you know, their one number number one, the fourth overall pick is worse than a fourth, you know, fourth or fifth round pick they took in the same position. They traded away their best young corner. Uh, their safety that they drafted in the first round this year was out for the season after like the first game. Like there's a lot that they have to overcome offensively. And then Colt Miller, one of the worst tackles in the league last year. Trent Brown, a free agent signing. Wide receivers, as you said, without Antonio Brown, who aren't making any of us, you know, scared. And they're still doing it and getting Derek the most Carr. out of an average quarterback. Or they're Derek playing a last play schedule. Zone. Or yeah. they play in a last place schedule. Yeah, but to your point though, like they they covered the spread against Houston, right? They beat the Lions, who are a decent up and coming team. Uh, obviously, Chargers as well. You know, they beat the Bears in London. Trust right? me, they I'm, beat the Colts on the road. Like this I'm is on a, board. this is not a bad team. I'm on board on them being in the mix because again, I think you take Derek Carr too, who peaked in 2016. Looked like he was, you know, the next great top eight quarterback. He's back down 2017 and last year with Gruden. And then this year he's back in that top eight to ten mix, the way he's been playing and all that stuff. So anytime you take a guy that I think has played what I like to call mid-tier quarterback, that's where I think Dak's been the last couple years, and you elevate them back up, then that's a good coaching job. I'm going to start flying the banners over uh, Oakland now. I mean, think about the narrative for this team. The Cleo Mack trade, they get roasted for it. 
we all said it was a great trade. And I mean, lo and behold here, Khalil Mack, not exactly. And they didn't even execute on the draft picks and it's still a good trade. Well, thank you for getting me to my next point, <laughs> which is they literally burned a couple of first round draft picks. Cleveland Farrell's not even the best edge defender that they drafted this year. You mentioned the, the safety that got hurt, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Abram. Abram. Yep. Um, and, and then the other first round pick was a running back who has He's the been, top rated running back in sure, the Sure, but it NFL. doesn't matter, right? Like it's not, that's not, that's not moving the needle. Right, that's not the reason that they are in playoff contention. It's all of the other things around it that allow him to be a good running back. So, uh, I think he has to be on the table. But let's go ahead and pick right now your coach of the year, Steve. I'll start with you. You talked me into John Harbaugh. Good decision making. And look, I think if we did this systematically, we'd almost create the rubric, right? So you've got the decision making, whether it's second and longs, fourth down decisions, you, all that stuff, right? How many boxes do you tick there? And then I think at this macro level, are you maximizing your talent and that's the best example okay he's making good decisions and you've built your offense around Lamar who's now an MVP candidate and you know they were kind of we were talking about their defense this offseason they lost a lot of starters yeah we, yeah. we were talking about their defense they were going to be a great test case because you guys were spending all offseason saying coverage over pass rush coverage over pass rush and they got rid of all of their pass rush and they bring in Earl Thomas and then they bring in Marcus Peters midseason and it's like wow the secondary is incredible they're just going to manufacture some pass rush. They're playing and Madden cover on the back end. And, four corners on the field. And, so they're not the best defense in the league, but they're doing it in a unique way that hits home for us, I'd say, more than others. So I just, a lot of the structure is really good there. Bruce. Well, I'm not going to go to the same. I, I love what Harbaugh's doing. I really do, and how he's formulated his staff to fit the mold of what they have in the building talent wise. But I'm going with Kyle Shanahan because, look, we grade the quarterbacks every week. And Jimmy G's not playing out of this world. Yeah. You can expect. <laughs> Far from it, right. actually. So you can expect a few turnover-worthy plays every game. I feel like Kyle Shanahan, that offense, what he does with the screen game, formulating different ways to run the football with receivers, running backs, it doesn't matter. I just think he does a really good job trying to make that offense go, even though he has a quarterback that overdoes it sometimes. And, yeah, which he, he hired Robert Sala. That defense, they, they brought in some great players this, this year. So I think Kyle Shanahan, to expect that he was undefeated before the Seahawks knocked him off, I, I think he's, he's just been doing And amazing talk about job. a good leader. One of the best things that a leader can do is let other people shine. Yeah. And he is letting Robert Sala shine, and that, there's still a cohesive unit. I think that's right, impressive. Right. Yeah, it's, I, I, I think it's Harbaugh, but I'm going to give my choice that deviates a little bit. And I think this one, again, is to your point of grading quarterbacks – them not playing particularly well, but still winning in spite of it. And I think Sean McDermott in Buffalo mm, deserves some credit goal, because yeah. that's a defense that's built the way we would build a defense, which is pass, you know, pass rush, yes, but coverage is, is more important. Put the athletic players out there, both at linebacker, safety, and then obviously cornerback, uh, and, and build a defense uh, you know, that fits those players' strengths, draft players that fits your defense strength, uh, a la Tredavious White. Um, Josh Allen has been covered up to some degree. You know, we, we have not seen him exposed as much as we thought, and that offense has been a lot better as a result. Now they have an easy schedule, obviously, but to get that team to where they are right now, six and three, I think is an extremely impressive job. So after Harbaugh, for me, it goes uh, McDermott. That defense like has been that. legit yeah. since yeah. he's been there, pretty consistently last year. I really like years. that call. I like McDermott. Who you got? I, look, I'm. It doesn't matter after week 10. Oh, I can't geez, wait <laughs> for after week 17 to be flying the Gruden flag. But I'm going to give it. I'm not going to jinx it now. It, it's definitely Harbaugh in my mind. He's made the most correct decisions. He's turned around that organization analytically in one offseason. And then what he's done to allow Greg Roman to turn that, that offense around, yeah. I think, has just been fantastic. I mean, they're, we look at expected points added per play. Okay, their run offense would rank middle of the pack in terms of passing offenses. I mean, that's unheard of. It's unreal. They're lapping the field in what they're doing in the run game by making smart decisions. You can't just run the ball willy-nilly. The Niners kind of do that. They run yeah. the ball a lot on second and long. The Ravens run the ball a ton, but they don't run it in disadvantageous situations. That tells me he's listening to the math. That takes a really strong, confident head coach and leader. So to me, it's John Harbaugh right now. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.